There are lots of broken windows in the city of brotherly love, but by far the most important one is in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. When Marcel Duchamp's The Large Glass got smashed, he was not upset. In fact, he embraced the random accident as an equal partner in the making of his art. The museum has a wonderful show now of a very different kind of artist, a woodturner named David Ellsworth. Like Duchamp, Ellsworth embraces what is outside his control, whether it is the rounded, knotty growths on trees known as burls, or the discoloration and black lines known as spalting caused by the rotting of dead trees. The museum has welcomed the gods and goddesses of the arts since its beginning in 1876. And now they have welcomed David with a show in Gallery 119. Last Wednesday, I drove up to see his show and hear David talk about his life and work. Hi, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for coming out tonight. My name is Jenny Drozdek. I'm a manager of adult learning here at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. I'm really excited to present this program, which is part of our In the Artist's Voice series, where you get to hear from artists themselves. And I'm delighted to introduce David Ellsworth, whose distinguished career as a woodturner has helped shape and influence American contemporary craft. David received his MFA in sculpture from the University of Colorado in 1973. The following year, he started the woodworking program at the Anderson Ranch Arts Center in Snowmass, Colorado, and soon after opened his first private wood turning studio in Boulder. Around this time, he also developed a series of bent turning tools and the methods required for making the thin walled hollow forms of which he is known worldwide. David is the founding member of the American Association of Wood Turners, of which he was president from 1986 to 91, and its first honorary lifetime member. He has opened the Ellsworth School of Wood Turning at his home and studio in Bucks County since 1990. And David has written dozens of articles on craft and wood turning. And his first book, Ellsworth on Wood Turning, was published in 2008. In 2009, he was elected the Master of the Medium by the James A. Renwick Alliance of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. And he's also an honorary lifetime member of the Collectors of Wood Art and fellow and former trustee of the American Craft Council. You can find his work in the permanent collections of numerous museums, too many to name, but they include the Metropolitan Museum of Art and, of course, the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Please welcome David Ellsworth to the stage. And the first question I get from the woodturners is, who's Peter Volkus? <laughs> I really felt that I had a statement to say that I couldn't make in clay, because I had worked in clay for a year and a half. And I loved clay, and I loved the kinds of things that I was doing, and the movement of the material, and the ability to move the material. When I got into wood turning, I wasn't trying to make wood look like clay. I was trying to make wood do something that I'd not seen it done before. I'm constantly exploring that which is within my own realm, my own skill sets, my experience with the material that I work with. And I no longer dream about pottery. I'm making wooden pots. Wood has its own voice, and it never stops moving. It can be dry to moisture measure of some abstract number that I wouldn't have a clue of. But the way I'm looking at it, I wanted to observe it over a long period of time. I don't want it to stop, I want it to keep going. I intentionally try and get my head out of it because I know how easy it is to let your head get in the way. And if it doesn't give anything back to you, you misinterpreted it when you were making it, you just didn't know it. 
After I left the Anderson Ranch in Snowmass in 85, I went into this little barn in Boulder, Colorado. It's a 16 by 16 foot room in which I worked for two and a half years. The last year I put a partition down the center of it and lived in one side and worked in the other side. So that was before moving up to the mountains. And what I was doing there was following the old potter's line of producing a production item. And I needed something to stay alive financially, so I made these salt and pepper and sugar shaker sets. I did about 5,000 of them in two and a half years and sold them retail at the craft shows for $18 for the three. This was the first hollow form that I did successfully, that is, with some bent tools that I made. I had a lot of influence from ceramics. I was working and kind of getting a little bit bored with bowls, and I suddenly just started creeping in the opening and couldn't reach it with the tools that I was working with. So I came up with the idea of heating up and bending steel and working internally. So this was the origin of those early forms. It's actually a two-piece object. And what year was that? That was about 1976. This was my early inspiration, a Hopi potter named Nampeo, and she threw pots up until about 1917. What was, amazed me about these forms was the dynamic shapes of them, the fact that they were pinch pots, but they didn't collapse. So she obviously had very, very good control of the clay that she was using. They were coil formed in a bowl and then pulled out and then painted. But I just loved the work and I loved the color and that would come back into my work later. The primary element or design element of my work since about middle 1980s is the sphere. It's the most universal form that I know of. It's the most difficult form to design to because it's too perfect. And so it's a great challenge to try and figure out what to do to it to either improve it, modify it, or distinguish it in some way to the species that I'm working with so that you can become excited by it. This is a piece of spalted maple. It's about 11 or 12 inches in diameter. This is another sphere done out of a, another spalted piece, but it's a more solid material and it distorted into an oval shape. So I placed the pith or the center of the tree going diagonally through the form so it in fact from a sculptural standpoint, as you walk around it, it leans towards you on one side, it leans away from you on the other side, and is truly, in that respect, three-dimensional. How's that? They're hollow? They're all hollowed. The smallest ones are a sixteenth of an inch thick, the larger ones are a quarter of an inch. So that sounds like magic. It is magic. That's the whole point. <laughs> This is another one, this is one of my most favorite pieces. And here, using the sphere as a foundational element, I'm stretching it, I'm squeezing it, I'm pushing it around by virtue of the way in which I deal with the shape itself. This is red oak burl turned green, which I know is gonna distort dramatically after it dries, and it did. It's only about 10 inches tall, but I have photographed it from every angle that I can and it's always a different piece from a different angle. It's really wonderful. It's some very simple, elongated forms, about 15 inches tall, again working on the sphere, stretching it, squeezing it, dropping the opening in the top so the opening actually goes down inside. And the inspiration for that opening, that dropped opening, came from the Native American horno ovens, the bread ovens that would have an opening on the side to fill the, the logs inside to start the fire. And then the sculpted work in the adobe to create that smoke hole in it. It's an absolutely sensuous opening, and so I've incorporated that into the top of a lot of these styles of forms. Here's another one, similar to the one in the exhibition here. This is in the American Craft Museum. It's about 18 inches tall. It's a style of finish that I developed in the late 80s where I'm using the fork or the crotch of the ash tree where there's heavy, intense grain patterns. I turn the form, I take it outside, burn the hell out of it with my torch, go back inside, polish it up, sand back through the char to pick up the color of that figure grain in the piece, repolish it, and you get a translucent surface on it highly inspired by translucent glazes and ceramics that I did when I was an undergraduate. Here's another sphere, another blackened form. This was a piece that's in the Renwick collection, about 16 inches tall, done in ash and fired 
but not from the crotch of the tree, just straight through the tree, where I'm able to actually induce cracking in the central area of the tree. And depending on the extent of those cracks, sometimes I'll deal with inlays just to decorate those cracks. In this case, there are no inlays. The cracks just become part of the form. Very, very heavily inspired by Toshiko Takeitsu, of course. The form, the tiny opening, and just letting the material do what it does best. This is a triad of pieces. The tallest one in the back is four inches high out of spalted maple again. What I'm trying to do when I combine pieces like this is work with the, the parameters and design of the space between the forms as well as the forms themselves. It helps guide me, in effect, uh, to the refinements of the shapes of the objects. This is from the Solstice series. You'll see this piece upstairs in the gallery. It's 16 inches in diameter, late 80s, early 90s. It was a period at which all the galleries would pretty much close their doors because it was the height of a big recession. And so we kind of went into the studio and started making things that we figured nobody would want and just let our fantasies go. And I speak in the plural because so many of my friends did exactly the same thing and came out with new bodies of work in all different media around the country. The color goes back to the plastic that I was casting when I was in graduate school in flexible polyester resins. And I just incorporated the concept of that heavy amount of color into the really black background of these pieces. I started with spheres. I went to what I called interspheres, so you could gain access to the interior, both through looking down into it, but also through the openings of the side and then going into monospheres. This piece is upstairs also. And that's about 30 inches tall. This one's upstairs. It's uh, almost five feet tall. It's in redwood burl. It's a cylindrical form. It's open at the bottom and the top. Quite a dramatic piece. I was only able to do one of these. And unfortunately, it got to the late 80s and I ran out of money to ship big burls, three, four, five tons to the East Coast, because everything I was doing was on spec. So I had this one three-ton burl that I was working on and utilized the root system in the bottom of the burl to create the openings for the feet of the bottom of this form. It's called the Sentinel. And then this is from a new series I started three years ago called Emergence. I wanted to become more linear with my work, get a little taller, but I also realize I'm also getting a little bit older, and the physicality of working beyond three feet was, I thought, beyond me at that point. This is seven feet. It allowed me, as a telescopic concept, to work with a sense of grace within the forms in the same way that I do with my hollow pieces. None of this is done on the lathe, by the way. They're all done on the bandsaw. They're cut and stretched out. Like if you think of the old Cub Scout cups, that, the little aluminum cup that raised up. Same concept. It came about because a friend of mine, Mark Lindquist, sent me a piece of wood that he knew that I couldn't do anything on the lathe with it. And he'd already sold whatever I made to a guy in Johns Creek, Georgia. All I had to do was make it and deliver it and get paid. And I thought, well, I don't take commissions, but this doesn't really sound that terribly difficult but I had to go to a completely new system. So I redesigned my whole approach to the vessel form and came up with these objects here, of which there are 11 of them so far, and I've got six more in process in the studio. This is another grouping of three pieces. A lot of people have equated this for the male and a teenager and a mother, if you wish. It's always fun to put them into a context behind a camera and see what kind of domestic violence you can create. <laughs> Um, they're all out of black ash burl, wonderful pieces actually, all cylindrical hollow forms. This is a shot of me working on a lathe, for those of you who are not familiar with a lathe, and I'm making one of those tall pieces. The central core of that will become the teenager, in fact. This is our house up near Quakertown. It's shaped like a boat. 60 feet long and 30 feet wide and 18 at each end and drawn. It's like a rectangle with the ends squeezed together down in the woods. This is the interior, dining room, living room, kitchen to the left. And then 10 years ago, Wendy and I built another house out in old family property in Colorado at 8,500 feet. This is that house there. And introduce you to the view that we have up to 14 and a half thousand feet and a few of our neighbors. <laughs>
After his lecture in a Q&A with curator Elizabeth Agro, David led a tour of his show in Gallery 119. The piece in the corner is one of those ash pieces that I have burned and then sanded back through and then brought a translucent finish on it. And you'll see a little crack along the side, which I decided to decorate with two little inlays, little stitches. I don't think of cracks as being faults. They're statements about. In the 80s, most turners who were doing vessel forms like this were working with what we call natural edge vessels. Very exciting to design around the opening, so it's a balancing act when you're working on the machine to get the correct shape to begin with. The dark low one was a piece that I did around 1981. There was an 18-month period when I was opening up the hole and beginning to engage what was going to happen on the inside, even though you couldn't see it very well. The spalted piece that has the pith going diagonally through the form, so it formed that elliptical shape going from the upper right down to the lower left. An eighth to three thirty seconds of an inch thick all the way through. And when I get done with it, I take it and hang it up with a hook and let it dry through the opening. It takes about three or four days for it to dry out. Between the third and the fourth day, all of a sudden, you get all this movement. That's when it picks up its own attitude, its own shape. <laughs> These pieces are from that Solstice series. I know absolutely nothing about the cosmos. I took a couple of astronomy courses and loved them for the distance and the scale, but I knew nothing really about them. Yet, I thought about explosions, I thought about color, I thought definitely about fire, and what they might be, or rivers of lava, or all sorts of fun things that could be entered. But also I thought about the relationship between chaos and order. It's a classic old artist's conundrum. And what I really wanted to do was to give these elements order. That became the sequence of holes. And the concept there came from a photograph in a National Geographic back in the 80s, the complete eclipse of the sun. And it started out at point zero, and it got bigger, and then it went up back to point zero. And I said, like, my god, what a beautiful sequence that is. I'm making very chaotic objects. They're burned, they're painted, some done with dog's hair brushes, some done with sponges, some done where I just put the paint on directly from the tube and I mix it with an air compressor hose on the surface of the wood and push it around until it circumvents the entire form. It's great fun. The panels on the wall are a collaboration between Wendy and myself. Wendy is a, a terrific bead artist, has been working for 40 years in beads. We had done a series of smaller panels like this about 10 years ago. And serendipitously, we ran into some really nice chunks of quarter sawn white oak that were dry as a bone, and I decided to make some panels. She said, oh, goody. So she did the flowers, and we spent, what, a year and a half doing those? Well, you'll have to tell us which flowers are which. There's a white lotus and a purple lotus. Then there's a sunflower. Then there's a poppy on the left, and then wisteria at the top. So when Elizabeth saw those in Wendy's studio up at our place, she said, ooh, we can do something with that. I thought it was very important to show a collaboration. We can also introduce Wendy into the picture, which was, I think, very crucial to David's life. And I think even to do beadwork is completely meditative. And to have them above chaos and order, I think, is kind of fun. Yeah, she quite often will come over and ask me how many I made today. <laughs> beadwork being such a labor-intensive field. Creativity results from the imagination. The Ellsworths know this. Marcel Duchamp did too. And the Philadelphia Museum of Art is encouraging our imaginations in every program it hosts. I'm Elizabeth Agro, the Nancy M. McNeil Associate Curator for Modern and Contemporary Craft and Decorative Arts at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And these are drawings that were made by children very much inspired by David Ellsworth's work. Take a look. And how do museum goers respond to these shows? We've had quite a success with this series. It's one of the most popular spaces that people come to. And I think because it's contemporary, but also it's relatable. These are materials we're familiar with. 
I'm always trying to challenge the notion of what is sculpture and what is contemporary about these works. And that's my goal.